My name is Matthew. I'm part of the facilitation team. I'm just going to be helping kind of walk us through what we're going to do in this room today. As I'm sure most of you are aware, this is the new mobility room. We're going to start off with um, a short presentation from Alex and Pina from Waterfront Toronto, about 10 minutes or so. And then we're going to use the balance of time for discussion at our, at our tables. We're going to have some small table discussions for the majority of the time. And then we'll take the last five minutes or so just before we do a rotation uh, to get a, a quick report back from the table facilitator um, at each of your tables so that we get a flavor for what the various tables were, uh, were talking about. Um, we have people from the facilitation team. If you're a table facilitator, put your hand up. Great. And I think we have uh, Darnell will be back in a second as well. Um, so if you're, not a, if you're at a table that doesn't have one, you can join us at, uh, at one of those tables. Uh, we also have Waterfront Toronto who are going to do the presentation. We'll also be uh, roaming around while we have the discussions to answer any questions or provide comments on the feedback. Um, and there may also be uh, people from Sidewalk Labs who are here just to listen today as well. Uh, so with that, I'm just going to turn it over to Pina. We're going to go through the presentation. Just ask that you hold any questions until we break into the table discussion so that we can get through the presentation before we start the, start the conversations. Thanks a lot. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pina Malazzi, and I'm the Vice President for Design at Waterfront Toronto, and I'm joined by Alex Mariu, who's our Project Manager for Transportation and Transit. This is the mobility room, so let's first make sure we're all in the right place. Looks good. Okay. Um, Waterfront Toronto, since its inception, has been committed to the delivery of transit and undertook extensive planning in this area. Of area. For many, many years, we've been leading uh, transportation planning, including uh, leading the environmental assessment, uh, which um, uh, for the Eastern Waterfront Transit Line, which is the LRT line that is proposed to go from Union Station along Queen's Quay and into the Portlands area. We've also successfully delivered both uh, one of the first new LRT lines in Toronto in a while on Cherry Street and a revitalized complete street on Queen's Quay. So one of the first things we did in this project uh, was to establish a series of objectives that would help guide us through uh, the mobility work stream. Uh, one of the primary objectives is to reduce automobile emissions in order to achieve climate positive uh, targets that are being talked about in the sustainability room. We have uh, two different strategies for achieving this. For example, reducing automobile dependency, and secondly, uh, ensuring that we can accommodate electric vehicle infrastructure. Another objective was to reduce congestion, and there's multiple forms of congestion. You can see in the image here what I think comes to mind when we say the word congestion, but we're also experiencing increase in curbside congestion with the uh, rise of Uber and Lyft technologies. We're also experiencing congestion on our bike paths. For example, the Martin Goodman Trail on the waterfront um, out, out front of our office, or actually right out front of this hotel, gets between 600 and 800 uh, riders per hour in the AM, PM peak uh, during the summer. So that's a lot of riders for one uh, piece of infrastructure. We've also established an, as an objective to ensure that mobility can be affordable for everyone who lives and works uh, and passes through Keyside. And we want to ensure uh, that everything uh, we build from a mobility perspective is safe and apply vision zero principles. And lastly, we want to remove barriers to accessing ex and experiencing the waterfront for all users. So we've had a few consultations already and I want to walk through a summary of the public feedback that we've received uh, through this process. This is just a sample, and if you want more details on this, there's a very big report on our website that summarizes every bit of feedback we got. Uh, so that's on the keysideto.ca website. So first of all, on the support side, we've heard uh, in every one of the engagements that we've done, and we certainly heard it loud and clear, the importance of prioritizing the delivery of the uh, already approved transit plan for the waterfront. We've heard how important it is to ensure that our mobility plans for the future uh, are aligned with our climate positive objectives. And we've heard how important it is to continue to enhance cycling infrastructure on the waterfront. Areas that we've been asked to consider, the first one is around access. And I think we heard it again this morning, um, the idea that Keyside can't be disconnected from the rest of the city, can't feel like a bubble. It needs to be integrated with everything else that's going on in the city. We want to ensure, uh, or we've heard 
that it's really important to prioritize safety and vulnerable, uh, especially for vulnerable users, uh, to ensure that, uh, especially as you introduce new ideas in mobility, that we still put accessibility at the heart of uh, uh, innovating. And lastly, that we ensure that mobility costs don't increase because of innovative ideas. So, we're here to talk about our evaluation of the solutions. So as you heard in the plenary, there were a total of 160 solutions across the project. 32 of those solutions are within the mobility stream. And actually, if you want a full list of those 32 solutions named with the score that they got, if you look inside of your discussion guide, attachment number four, which is the red attachment, has that full list of solutions. So after completing a thorough review of each of these solutions, which included us ranking the effectiveness of the solution based on the objectives that we set and uh, had consultation on, evaluating the risks and trade-offs of each of the solutions, and getting feedback through the consultations on some of these solutions, Waterfront Toronto supported 31 of the solutions. Each of these solutions was then categorized in three varying degrees of support. First of all, support and advocate for regulatory reform, and six solutions scored in that bucket. Support and advocate for government funding, nine solutions scored in that bucket. Support with WT investment, four solutions ranked in that bucket. And then the remaining 12 solutions were considered to be very effective, uh, but that they're best left to the private sector to implement. As was noted in the plenary uh, discussion, these conclusions do not mean that Waterfront Toronto has approved moving forward uh, with the project or a partnership with Sidewalk Labs. It does mean that Waterfront Toronto sees merit in including these solutions in its draft innovation plan for Keyside. What we're going to do next is Alex is going to walk through just some examples of solutions in each of those categories. Thanks, Pina. So, as Pina just mentioned, although my rehearsed version always re repeats this, is that I'm going to go through uh, five example solutions that uh, and talk about why we arrived at the conclusions that we did. So the first one is wayfinding beacons, and um, our evaluation committee agreed that this is a solution that we would support through Waterfront Toronto Investment. So what a wayfinding beacon is, and uh, there is a bit of an image here to try to depict it, but really it's a digital solution. If this was a wayfinding beacon, it would be broadcasting information to an application. Applications exist right now, such as Blind Square, that are a wayfinding app to help people that are partially sighted or blind navigate an environment. So just using Google Maps, for example, there's only so much information that you would hear from Google Maps, but Blind Square is another layer of information that can help the blind or partially sighted navigate indoor and outdoor and public and private environments. So moving on to the next example, this is another example of a solution that Water, or Waterfront Toronto would be interested in investing in. So this is expanding the active transportation network, so the bicycle network and pedestrian network, to the front door of every building. So right now, this dark green line at the top of Keyside site is currently an approved and planned bicycle, uh, bicycle cycle track as part of Toronto's um, network planning, and it's already approved, and same with Martin Goodman Trail, which exists today. So in addition to those, on Quayside, we would see bicycle facilities on these hatch lines, so on the side roads. So it's not just bicycle infrastructure on the main thoroughfares, but on side streets as well. <coughs> so since Waterfront Toronto is responsible for delivering and planning the public infrastructure at Quayside, it's not a stretch for us to ensure that we also deliver on this objective. So dynamic curves, this is an example of a solution that we would, as an organization, advocate for in terms of policy and regulatory reform. So a dynamic curb, and in the discussion guide, it's actually broken out into three distinct solutions, but collectively described as um, a lay-by space that can transform between pickup and drop-off for vehicles and public space for pedestrians. So depending on what the demand for that space is, it can transfer between those uses 
to address what the demand on the time of day or time of week, depending what the needs are in the public realm. It also streamlines the communication of how that space is used at any given time. So what the policy for that space is at any given time through digital signage. So you would be able to see, oh, right now that's what this space is used for. And through communication, uh, streamlining communication between the infrastructure and connected vehicles or connected devices in the future. And then another portion of that is pricing the curb effectively so that it is priced based on what its value is. So right now, if you get picked up or dropped off on Queens Key West, um, and there's a high demand for that curb space, it's currently not priced. Parking is priced, but pick up and drop offs aren't priced. And in the future where there's a huge demand for that use, we'll have to start thinking about how to price that use. And then one more example of something we've included, but lower down on the threshold is a discounted mobility package. So the first part of this is grouping services together that currently would require you to, for example, get a Metro Pass and a Toronto Bike Share membership and pay the prices for those individually. But grouping those together as one package could be offered at a discounted rate. And then the other part of that is actually offering those services in one single platform, an application, for example, that allows you to plan your trip, pay the fare, and get real-time information about those modes and collectively um, use those modes for any given trip. So there are significant challenges, at least in the scope of our organization, to make this happen. So that's why we've just said it should be included, but really up to the private sector to work with the public sector service providers to deliver something like this. So it's really up to the private sector to deliver and really we support it, just not any investment from our organization. And then the last one here is really the only of the 32 solutions that we didn't support. And although we've asked for outdoor comfort systems, the specific solution to that that was proposed by Sidewalk Labs was a raincoat system, which would require, re require structures that are um, with footings in the public realm that could create barriers to access um, and, and actually be a hindrance to accessibility. So that's an example of something we didn't, didn't uh, support. Thanks a lot. So we're gonna, in just a second, move into our table discussions. As I mentioned, there's a facilitator at each one of your tables and they're really here to help facilitate the conversation and take notes. They are not the subject matter experts, but we do have uh, people from Waterfront Toronto in the room that can help to answer questions um, and comment on, on feedback that you have. These are the, the four questions that Waterfront Toronto is looking for some feedback on. Um, so do you agree with Waterfront Toronto's conclusion that Sidewalk Labs proposal sufficiently addresses challenges they're trying to address, why or why not? And again, in this room specifically related to new mobility solutions, um, are there any solutions uh, that you would like to see prioritized? So ones you like and think should be prioritized, which ones and why? On the reverse side of that, are there any solutions you're, you have concerns about or you're concerned about? Again, which ones and why? And then any other thoughts um, or comments related to the proposals? Again, as was mentioned earlier, if there's other things that you'd like to discuss at your tables, um, by all means, please share that with us. We're, we're keen to hear that too. Uh, there's some pink, pink pieces of paper that have these questions. So as you're having those discussions, if you want to write your comments down as well and leave those with us, that's great. Um, and again, if with about five minutes less left in about 25 minutes or so, we'll come back together as a group and we'll hear report backs um, from the tables. Um, are there any questions about the process, about what we're going to do in the next few minutes? Great. So I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, the table facilitators um, and we'll also have Waterfront Toronto roaming around um, to help out too. Thanks a lot. I'm going to go to, uh, to Jay at the front table first, just a minute or two, um, kind of reflection on what was discussed, and then we'll kind of work our way around, around the room. Hi, everyone. So uh, my, my table had a really good uh, discussion. Um, we had a lot of uh, sort of concerns that were brought up. So one of them was um, speaking of the LRT that was originally proposed and stating that um, uh, earlier in the MIDP there was a statement that uh, development wouldn't start if there was, um, unless there was an LRT. 
Um, so uh, my, my table is kind of concerned about what's the status of that? How are they going to connect with um, different sort of transit bodies like Metrolinx TTC? So what's the, how's it going to connect to the greater network? Um, another one was, uh, just to quickly paraphrase, how is it going to be affected by the Ontario line as well? Um, since the uh, since Metrolinx has proposed that, and how is it all going to connect with one another? Another one was also uh, discussed was, um, what if you don't have a smart device uh, and you come in the area? Are there other ways of that the way fi wayfinding apps uh, technology can help you out? And how so? Like, are there s different products that will be available at Keyside or you know by Sidewalk Labs and how they're going to implement that? Um, we had one like like uh, smart cane, which was a interesting uh, sort of topic. Um, the other one was curbs. If uh, there there's no main curb area and it's all going to be highlighted by um, like lit strips and changed over time, how is that going to change uh, for accessibility needs for people who are blind or visually impaired who rely on curbs as a way to actually you know find their way and step on top? So those are just, uh, that's just me quickly paraphrasing, but yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll do the same thing. I'll just really high level talk about um, some of the key themes that came out through our conversations. So a lot of the conversation came, um, was around, you know, the distance of this location is just far enough that what will be really essential is having LRT or some kind of a connecting transit system. Um, to make it more accessible, make sure people are going to that area and making sure it's, uh, it's, it's working with its surrounding, uh, surrounding areas. Um, a lot of our table discussion was around future proofing. So if you have all this technology that's going to be implemented, you know, in, in five years, how will that technology be, like, will that be outdated in, in 15 years, 20 years, um, and everything from infrastructure to the actual technology that's implemented. So a lot of future proofing was discussed. So we had a great discussion. Um, comments um, uh, like the other table on uh, expanded transit, specifically the waterfront east LRT, and wanting clarification um, stating that it was a prerequisite for a project like this um, and what the state of that streetcar um, project is. Waterfront Toronto did clarify um, that they were leading a 30% um, of the design work and the TT of the above ground work and, th and TTC was um, going to lead the 30% design work of, um, of the underground work uh, in order for city to, to approve funding of that but overall um, a notion that uh, the LRT was was imperative and needs to be uh, moved up um, in um, in the pipeline of uh, of city transit projects. Questions around the interface of urban planning and digital technology and what is considered uh, IP and what is considered to be um, uh, city uh, infrastructure. Um, and uh, and there was a clarification that if Waterfront Toronto likes something that uh, that uh, Google has a solution for, then um, Keyside would be an opportunity to uh, to test it. Um, there was um, comments around the uh, ability to test. Um, alternative transit modes and for alternative transit modes to be considered uh, in Keyside um, and uh, the imperative that it needs to um, that we need to introduce new networks that also interface into existing networks uh, so if there was a better way to use space there was clarification that maybe new technology uh, would be considered uh, during the design um, or RFP exercise it was a red flag on, lead on um, blanket language around leaving things for the private sector to figure out. Uh, some cities have already figured out uh, guidelines around this and that the city needs to be um, uh, kind of at the center of setting guidelines within which uh, private sector um, uh, would operate and uh, that uh, this could be a benefit to the whole region and improve uh, inter user interface greatly. And the last comment um, 
around uh, potentially um, having Keyside as something like an, uh, declaring it as an enterprise zone uh, to become immune to some city requirements. Um, and there was a comment around uh, parking being one. Uh, so current parking ratios, if the city sticks to its current parking ratios for Keyside, then it won't um, change the mobility paradigm. So um, there was an idea to, to have it uh, immune to some city requirements um, so, that, uh, so that it could move faster towards more innovative pieces. That's correct, yes. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so we had a very uh, vibrant exchange here at our table. Overall, we would certainly say that there is support for all the mobility solutions that were presented. Um, however, there is also complete agreement that it's hard to really uh, fully supported at this level just because much more granular detail is needed as to how a number of these things might in fact flow out. Um, mobility is of course very important to get somewhere, be it you know the LRT, which of course was a, a topic of discussion here, um, as well as um, bikes or other, other, f other forms of movement, both flowing through the site as well as flowing to the site. Um, However, the issues really lie in problems with maintenance and, you know, fact is solutions do in fact need to work in practice. And so, for example, issues with scooters in San Francisco where they're having issues with them, you know, although parking spaces do exist, people don't use them, things like that. Um, and the Presto card issues, which I'm sure um, I would just say, I feel the room is probably familiar with what those might be. Um, so I would say overall, though, there was there was support for a number of uh, interests, a number of different things, including the pricing, including the discounted mobility packages, um, and a number of the pieces around movable curbs and other uh, trade hubs. And I think just to expand on one of the points Darnell said that I overheard at this table was around the um, support for the discounted mobility package but really understanding how that would be implemented and really a need to um, have checks and balances in place so that it's not taken advantage of um, and that there was some caution that some of the existing systems presto things like that where there is kind of um, there's opportunities to use it across different modes that there can be some opportunity to take advantage of that so making sure that there's checks and balances in there as well so um, that was great, just a quick highlight kind of of the conversations we had. The facilitators taking detailed notes, which will all get wrapped into the, the draft summary, which will be shared with everyone uh, following these meetings. So uh, just because you didn't hear it in the, um, in the wrap up there doesn't mean it's not going to get captured. That said, if when you review the summary, if it's not there, let us know and we can certainly um, add it in, as well as any feedback you've written down and leave with us. And then also um, there's the opportunity to provide feedback online up until the end of this end of next month starting tomorrow march march first end of march 31st um so with that um i'll just i'll encourage you now to go and find another room uh, that you're interested in as well there's an opportunity for one more rotation and then we'll meet back in the plenary room um before the end of the day i'm just going to look at my agenda for the exact time um probably about 4 25 or just before 4 30 we'll do a, a wrap up in there and then we'll move on Yep, there's uh, the Sustainability and Resilience and Climate Positive Room, which is down past, a few yards past the main room. There's um, Complete Communities, which is just next door to that main room we were in. And then there's Economic Development, Digital and Partnership, which is in the, in the plenary room where we started. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate your time.